Becky, Michelle Holko here. Um, I'm currently a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow, which is a very interesting program. If you have any questions about that, let me know because we're actually, application cycle is actually open right now. Um, and the goal of that program is to bring folks in from the private sector to do a tour of duty at a leadership level within the government. Um, we're situated under the executive branch, initially under the White House. Now we've moved over to GSA TTF. Um, but we detail out to agencies. So we've got a lot of PIFs in the VA, FDA, um, CMS, I'm at NIH, and really pretty much all over. Um, and the goal of the PIF is to bring technology into government. My specific background is more in the biotech space. Um, I've done some work with DARPA and BARDA. Um, my technical background is in genomics and bioinformatics, but also wearables and data analysis, anal analytics. Um, and so um, I'm kind of working at the intersection of emerging technology um, and technological applications and how they can be applied um, to biology. This discussion, I thought it would be, be good to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what is happening here? Like, what is happening on the ground? What is the problem that we're trying to, um, to, to help? Um, and so the first thing to, to consider is the individual's infectious cycle. And this isn't a perfect, um, complete scenario. So, you know, ideally, left of this, left of exposure, you would talk about surveillance, right? Surveillance of a population before exposure. Um, but then there is an exposure event, um, which is currently kind of a tricky thing. We don't know actually when that's happening, um, unless you are doing really, really in-depth contact tracing. Um, and so, and that's another, you know, potential avenue where technology could help because there's this, then there's this kind of long period, well, it's actually debatable right now how long it is before symptom onset, between exposure and symptom onset, where someone is replicating virus um, and spreading those viruses and, and the level of spread, we, we also don't know. Um, and so that's like a pre-symptomatic contagious period. Um, and we already have early indication from technology that, there, that technologies are able to pick up pre-symptomatic um, changes in a uh, person's, you know, kind of, um, you know, heart rate or sleep patterns or things that can indicate that they are going to become symptomatic, that they have been exposed and that they are contagious, right? So that's one opportunity there. Um, and then a person goes forward, seeks, a, seeks out, um, you know, medical um, advice and then gets a, a diagnosis with diagnostic testing. Um, and then to the right of this, um, you can think about, you know, the recovery period, um, the quarantine period, um, and all of those other things. Um, so, you know, along this continuum, I see a lot of opportunities here, especially around this pre-symptomatic identification, potentially around contact tracing, um, but certainly around potentially symptom tracking. Um, and then when you think about diagnostic testing, you know, how can we use technology to do that in a, in a better way? You know, the flu near you study has done a really nice job of kind of sending people a flu test. Um, and then, um, you know, when the COVID um, outbreak started happening, they just turned that into a COVID test, right? And so that was a really um, kind of innovative pivot of a framework that was already in place um, in order to answer the question. And, and I've heard some interviews with people that participated in that were very grateful. So next slide. So then thinking about how, um, um, how, how does that differ at the individual level? So this is... Um, I really love this, this idea of these kind of disease recovery loops um, because these are based on biology, right? So this is an example from David Schneider's lab who, who he kind of spearheaded this, um, this thinking, he's at Stanford. Um, and this is specifically looking at malaria. So one of the hallmarks of malaria is that you have to recover your blood cells enough. You have to grow enough new blood cells in order to recover from the illness. So you're looking at immature blood cell count um, on the bottom, red blood cell count on the top. Um, and then what he saw is that there's this looping pattern as a person goes from, um, you know, not being sick into sickness and then recovery and then comes back to that loop. So an, uh, a person who is maybe at lower risk, one of the lower risk categories, doesn't have any of the comorbidities um, that, that certainly change the way that a person can recover from illness might be on the left, whereas the high risk patient might be on the right. Um, they might be starting from a different place. Um, and then they might shift during that sickness into the red zone, which is, you know, a, a, an unrecoverable space, right? And so this is another area where I think that technology, we could potentially leverage to try and track, like, who are the high-risk patients? Who are the more disease-resilient patients? And is our thinking accurate? You know, I think that one of the things that's been surprising about this um, epidemic and now pandemic is that um, it's not following a, a lot of the, the normal patterns that, that we have been tracking pandemics. Um, have been thinking about. And so are there ways to use technologies, wearables, to give us a, a, a less biased view 
to um, do a little bit more discovery around what are those high risks. Is it blood pressure? Is it, you know, I think there are a lot of potential things um, that it could be. Um, so next slide. So then moving from the individual level to thinking at more of a population level, and I think everybody's probably familiar with these epidemic curves, but it's just the number of new infections per day over time, right? And so um, the red, and I love this because this, this is coming from a National Academy um, of Sciences um, publication last year, just last year, 2019, um, about um, lessons learned from a century of outbreaks. Right. And so here they were projecting, looking towards 2030, trying to be prepared for the next big outbreak in 2030. Right. And then just the following year, we're having this huge outbreak. And I think, you know, another thing that that I have observed from being in the field for so long is that um, due to climate change, due to the way that our society has changed, we are a global community, you know, the way that we interact. I think that this is the first of more to come. Right. And so this is a great opportunity to start to build systems and technologies and, and solutions so that we can do this better every, every, every time, right? So let's build things that are, can be carried forward and help us in the future because I, I, I truly believe that this is the first of more to come. Um, so anyway, so going back to this, this chart. So one of the things I like about this is because it shows how you can change the way that the curve looks depending on what you do. So just by adding early antiviral use, so in this case, um, there was an antiviral available initial, uh, um, at the outset, um, you're able to shift the curve over and dampen it a little bit, right? And, so, and that's the yellow line. So then if you further combine that with non-pharmaceutical interventions and PIs, which is what we're doing right now with social distancing, you can further shift it over and dampen again, right? And so then if you're able to combine that with the vaccine, then you're able to have just a really kind of a low blip at green, right? And so this is the ideal scenario is that you're able to leverage all of these tools. You're able to do some modeling to figure out, you know, what do you need to do in order to get this to, and then next slide. Um, the next thing is this is the, pl the plot from CDC um, adopted from The Economist that everybody has seen, I'm sure, um, where the epidemic curve without protective measures versus the epidemic curve with protective measures. In this case, we're talking about social distancing that we're all doing, which is why we're all connecting every single day virtually with children in the background. Um, and the important thing to discuss here is the healthcare system capacity. Um, and this is drawn as a straight line, and that is absolutely inaccurate, right? Um, we know that healthcare system capacity is different depending on where you are, right? It's also going to be different as we move through this, right? So the, the, um, the nurses and the doctors on the front lines, they're going to um, gonna be depleted. Um, the PPE is already becoming depleted. And how do, you, how do you start to measure, you know, the ventilators, so the workers, the beds, the ventilators, um, PPE, um, and, and a number of other things that, that contribute to healthcare system capacity? How can you start to leverage technology to track those things so that we can have a better awareness of what we need where.